Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have another ECE colloquium that's co-sponsored by QuantumX. That's the campus-wide effort to promote uh, quantum computing, communication, and sensing. Uh, Dr. Nathan Webb received his PhD in 2011 from University of Calgary studying quantum computing. And then he did a postdoc in Institute of Quantum Computing at University of Waterloo. And in 2013, he joined uh, Microsoft Research uh, working on quantum computing and he stayed there for almost six years. And very recently, he joined the faculty of University of Washington and joined Pacific Northwest National Lab as a senior scientist. Uh, Professor Dr. Webb's um, research is focuses on quantum computing and quantum methods for machine learning and simulation of physical systems. And his work has provided the first quantum algorithms for deep learning and quantum simulations using linear combination of unitaries. So let's welcome Professor Webb. Great. Thanks a lot, Arka. And uh, it's great to have such a, such a big audience here today. Um, so, OK, you might be wondering, what's with the title, Nathan? You know, it's, uh, if you excuse the pun, a little bombastic. Oh, come on. Is it that early in the morning? I can't get a laugh out of that. Ugh. All right, fine. I'll, uh, I'll compensate for this audience. But in any case, this book over here, for those of you who, who haven't read it, for me was one of the most interesting books that I read when I was back in high school. What it did is it chronicled the uh, uh, atom bomb project. And while the atom bomb, of course, you know, is symbolic of kind of one of the most frightening things that humanity has ever invented, the story about what it took in order to be able to build this from the perspective of engineering, uh, physics, computation, required an unprecedented degree of collaboration between different disciplines in order to achieve something really remarkable. And so from my perspective, it's my hope that the 21st century will see actually in that sense a very similar sort of collaborative effort coming together in order to be able to build the first quantum computer. And what I'd like to do in this talk is kind of give you an idea about what quantum computing really is, where quantum computing ends up getting its power from, and what sort of a quantum computer would we likely see discussed in a book published in the future talking about what it was like to build the first quantum computer, right? And this, this, I think, is very important, especially to look at from the engineering perspective, because of the fact that it'll help everybody, I think, understand the different ways that people can contribute to this. Because it isn't just going to be computer scientists. It isn't just going to be physicists. It's going to be a wide range of people, and potentially even some new disciplines that don't presently exist that will be needed in order to get us from where we are right now to this era where we have a useful quantum computer that can solve real world problems. So Arka already introduced me, so I won't spend ter terribly much time uh, going over all of this. But I just wanted to mention, I'm only going to be talking about a really limited, narrow slice of my research, uh, particularly that which pertains to figuring out how big of a quantum computer we're going to need, what are the resources, and how do we calibrate and control large-scale quantum systems. Uh, for, if you're interested in any of these other topics down at the bottom, bug me afterwards. I'd love to talk about them. But anyways, the question, the question that I think a lot of people have is given the challenges that are inevitably are going to come up with building a quantum computer, a big question is why? And so, I think the original motivation for why to build a quantum computer came from Richard Feynman in 1982, where Feynman ended up uh, suggesting that he ran into this problem. Despite ha having a state-of-the-art state, state 386 computer, there were many problems that he couldn't solve. Some of them were embarrassingly simple. For example, solving the dynamics of 100 interacting electrons, which is a tiny system from a macroscopic perspective, would require a computer of enormous power. In fact, some estimates at the time suggested that you might need a planetary-sized computer in order to be able to simulate just that dynamics. And if you added a single electron to it, the laws of quantum mechanics would say you'd need twice the computational power in order to be able to deal with this. And that, that was terrifying. Because after all, where do the electrons keep their planetary-scale computer? Right? And so part of the reason for quantum computing is to actually kind of you know, 
turn this computa inherent computational power of physical systems kind of against itself and allow us to solve problems in chemistry as well as some problems in uh, optimization and uh, machine learning much faster, uh, as well as quantum field theory, cryptography, and things like this. So there are some really profound speed ups, in fact, exponential speed ups in some cases, that we can get over other hardware. And for that matter, there are some problems that we do not know how we could solve any other way efficiently other than building a quantum computer. So, the other thing that I should mention that's a, a reason why people are interested in it is that quantum information, while powerful, it has this other really neat property, which is its fragility. So quantum information is so sensitive that if you end up looking at it, you run the risk of damaging it. Now this, of course, is a very negative thing. It's one of the reasons why we don't have computers that can implement all of these things. But if you have data that shows signatures of observations, you can use this in order to guarantee that your data isn't being spied on. And by using this and looking for measurement-induced errors, you can actually guarantee that eavesdroppers aren't able to extract more than exponentially small information about the uh, computation you're doing or a message you're trying to send across. And the fun part is, is unlike existing cryptography, this isn't guaranteed by any assumptions about the hardness of a particular problem. The only assumption that fundamentally goes into this is that quantum mechanics is right. If quantum mechanics is right, then nobody, no matter how powerful their uh, uh, computers might be, will be able to get more than a small number of bits of information about your, your code. So that's another reason, privacy. But the other thing that actually is I got to admit, some part of me is most excited about is I'm really excited about the possibility that we might not be able to build a quantum computer. I know, you're probably looking at me kind of you know, strange about that. Why, what would be so exciting about not being able to build a quantum computer? Well, the answer is everything in the laws of physics that we know says that we ought to be able to build a quantum computer. There is nothing fundamentally that precludes it. Now, Last time, or we ended up looking at something kind of analogous to it, we could take, uh, we, let's take a look at James Watt when he was building a steam engine. When people like Watt and Carnot began taking a look at the fundamental limitations they seemed to be running into about the, uh, their ability to be able to produce, you know, hit a particular efficiency target for a heat engine, the second law of thermodynamics came up as a consequence of them not being able to make arbitrarily efficient heat engines. From that perspective, I, f I firmly believe that if we're unable to build a quantum computer for some deep reason, not just some, you know, it, 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 probably it can happen, it's just it looks like it's going to cost too much money. But if there's a fundamental reason why this is flawed, I suspect that this will lead to as profound of an insight uh, behind physics as the second law of thermodynamics was. So for me, that's another reason why people are interested in this conceptually, because of the fact it allows us to push towards an area that might expose our limitations or our limitations of our knowledge of physics. All right? So what is quantum computing? Fortunately, quantum computing is actually really easy to understand at a high level. So I'll, I'll give you an unconventional introduction to it. The easiest way to start understanding quantum computing is to take a look at a field called reversible computing. Reversible com quantum computing is actually just a generalization of reversible computing. So the idea behind reversible computing is it's just like the ordinary computing that you're used to, except we demand that there are absolutely no gates that you're allowed to carry out that can't be inverted. So for example, you know, a standard gate set that you would you know, use on, uh, at least theoretically on a computer, might be the AND and the NOT gate. Okay? You can build any uh, algorithm that you want in principle from those two gates. The problem is, is that the AND gate, if you take two bit values, A and B, and you only output their product, A and B, you can't invert, you can't go from the product and figure out what A and B are. For example, if you've got zero over here, you've got three options. You could have zero, one, one, zero, or zero, zero there. And you would never be able to tell from the output. So reversible computing, demands that we change this in order to keep information around so that we can always invert our AND gate. 
And so this generalization is this gate that we call the Toffoli gate, where basically the inputs, A and B, are stored afterwards. And this third line over here computes the AND. And so you can see that this looks just like the top case, except more memory uh, has to be kept around in, so that we can end up inverting everything. And this was originally uh, back in the 70s. People were interested in this, not because of quantum computing. It wasn't really kind of known at the time. But people were very interested in this in order to try to actually optimize the thermodynamics of computing by making it reversible. In principle, we can reduce the amount of waste energy behind it. And people like Charlie Bennett ended up showing that this was uh, reversible. Uh, interestingly, Charlie later on got into quantum computing and ended up being one of the, the, the great pioneers of it. But in any case, now let's take an, a one step towards quantum computing. So the step that we're going to take towards quantum computing is to add one tiny little extra thing to reversible computing. We're going to add the concept of probability distributions. So rather than definite bit strings being the objects that you're manipulating, now what we're going to have is we're going to have probability distributions on bit strings that these gates are acting on. Okay? So what ends up happening is, say we have a NOT gate. We've got some probability distribution over this bit value. We apply the NOT gate, and we'll get the exact same probability distribution, but with the, the values knotted. With the Toffoli gate, though, something a little bit more interesting ends up happening. What we end up getting, if we have a joint probability distribution over A, B, and C, then we'll end up getting a correlated probability distribution over A, B, and C coming out. So the, the, the analog of the AND gate in this case can build up correlations between the bits. But that's really kind of the only thing really that ends up coming in, except for the fact that when you take a look at the output here, you're not going to get a deterministic value anymore. It'll be random. But conceptually, everything's exactly like it was before. All right? So that's the idea. And again, yeah, measurement will do exactly this kind of a projection. Um, and uh, I say this <laughs> and only because of the fact that I'm going to generalize this to quantum in just a sec. But the only constraint, again, to remember here in the case of a probability distribution is that all the probabilities of all the outputs have to sum up to 1. OK? So that's how probabilistic reversible computing ends up working. Now, let's show you how quantum computing works. Quantum computing is exactly the same idea, except we've changed our definition of what the probability distribution is. So instead of having a probability distribution where the sum is equal to 1, now we're going to get the sum of the squares is equal to 1. So it's an L2 normalized probability distribution, or like a Euclidean normalized probability distribution, rather than an L1 normalized probability distribution. And that, believe it or not, it, from some perspectives, is the entirety of the difference between these two. Just going from an L1 to an L2 norm for your probability distribution actually gives you an exponential separation in power, which is really remarkable, I think. And so the, the exact same sort of things end up happening. We've got a NOT gate. Now, it, it's common for people to use psi, which is a quantum state vector, which is like a probability vector, but now it's some, the sum of the squares is equal to 1. Now, our Toffoli gate, which is like our reversible AND gate, will do exactly the same thing, except now, instead of a correlated distribution, we'll have a quantum correlated distribution, or something that people often like calling in the jargon an entangled state. Okay? So, that's basically it at a high level. So all right, congratulations. You guys are now understand quantum computing. So I can get on to the, I can get on to the applications now. But to give you an idea, though, I'd like, to, I'd like to jump in and show how this difference between L1 normalization versus L2 normalization has an impact on computation. It's necessary to take a step back and talk about what precisely is the computational model that people are using when they talk about quantum computing. Now, there's many different choices that you can make. But the standard one that people end up working with is this over here. So the way that this ends up working is that we encode our bit strings as unit vectors, because all quantum states are L2 normalized distributions, which correspond to unit vectors. Okay? So, if we want to represent the bit string 0, 0 over here, that's got to be stored as a unit vector quantumly. And so what we do is we use this kind of unary encoding, where 0, 0 is a unit vector 1, 0, 0. 0, 1 is 0, 1, 0, 0, so on and so forth. 
And so you can see with um, um, an n bit number is going to require a vector of length 2 to the n over here. Now, that classically, unary encodings of big numbers is probably a pretty bad idea. But quantumly, we get this for free. We only need n quantum bits in order to be able to store each of these vectors, not 2 to the n. Okay? So that's one of the advantages, but a probability distribution is exactly the same way. So there's no advantage there from that. The gates that we have that manipulate these vectors can be seen as matrices, right? Because matrices end up transforming vectors into new vectors. In particular, they're unitary matrices because they don't change the length of these vectors. So the, class, the, the, the ones that we use are the controlled knot, which works just like the controlled knot gate that you're used to. You know, if the control bit is 1, then it'll flip the second one. If the control bit is not 1, then it won't do anything to the second gate. At Toffoli gate, which is the controlled controlled knot that I spent a while talking about previously, again, works exactly the same way. Um, but we, we need some additional things added on. And those two additional things, minimally, are the Hadamard gate and the T gate over here. The Hadamard gate is very interesting because stochastically, what it kind of looks like, if you, if you take a look at it, is it'll take 0 and mix it into a 50-50 distribution of 0 and 1. Okay? So that really feels like flipping a coin. Okay? And it looks just like it probabilistically, except there's one difference. When you act on 1, taking a look at these coefficients, one outcome will be, I give you a minus sign. And that actually it turns out to be the essence of the power of quantum computing. The reason why is that if you've got an algorithm right, that has a probabilistic branch where you could go left or you could go right, what this quantum coin is doing is it's giving you negative amplitude for going on one side and positive amplitude for going on the other side. And what that means is that means if the two recombine later, you can actually get interference between those two branches. Whereas if you have a random walk, you're never going to get interference between the possibility that you moved right and the possibility that you move left, because everything is positive. And so I want to illustrate this actually directly by actually looking at precisely this problem, because it illustrates the importance of interference in quantum algorithms. And so let's consider you know, just a random walk. I flip a coin, heads, I move left, tails, I move right. Well, what, what do you expect from that? Well, what you expect is a Gaussian distribution of positions. If I want to explore, uh, say, this room by flipping a coin and doing a random walk, I'll have to take like a quadratically large number of steps before I'm likely to be able to hit the edge on one side. And so if, if I do that on a quantum computer, though, it turns out something, again, interesting happens because of that minus sign. What happens is that um, what Normally, what I'll end up doing is if I start here, flip the coin, if I start at 0, I'll get a 50-50 chance of going left and right. They're both positive. But now, if it was one of these two choices, when I go back, the Hadamard gate will give me a minus sign. And the, coin, the, uh, the quantum coin described by the Hadamard gate over here will give me a positive sign uh, returning this other direction. And therefore, these two amplitudes cancel each other out. So what happens with the quantum walk over here is the possibility of me starting in the middle and going left and right, first step, it's OK. But the possibility that I moved right is going to counteract this one, causing, forcing me to actually move left. And this changes, this interference changes the nature of the trajectory. Rather than it being Brownian motion, this is what it ends up actually looking like. It's actually ballistic motion. And so the time that it takes the quantum walker, because of interference in the middle, is actually linear. It's constantly having a lobe of probability, constantly moving right and constantly moving left. And this ballistic separation means that it actually takes, it turns out you can solve everything, quadratically less time for the quantum walker to be able to explore the space. OK, great. So a question you might ask is, if this interference is giving you this, well, quantum systems aren't the only things that have interference, right? Acoustic, optical waves, any physical waves, in principle, could give me a very similar interference effect. So why quantum? 
Well, a challenge that we run into with these is that if we have any analog form of computing, error correcting it is basically impossible because of the fact that you know, um, you've got a continuum of different possibilities. You can't just look at it and decode it back to a particular code word. In quantum, quantum's amazing because it's like these analog wave systems, but its measurement is digital. Every time you measure it, you will get a definite bit string. And it turns out that that is just barely digital enough for us to be able to error correct and error correct these particular quantum gates that I showed you previously. So that means that we actually, in a quantum computer, can get many of the benefits that we would have for an analog wave computer, but also get the robustness that we're used to from a digital computer. And that's really where kind of the hope and the great promise comes from. And the challenge of building and designing a quantum uh, algorithm is to use interference between these different options to some positive end, to get it to solve a problem for you rather than get, uh, having interference work against you. And so if you're wondering you know, whether this is difficult, yeah, it's pretty hard, <laughs> to be honest. It's taken years for us to really kind of develop good intuition for how to use quantum effects uh, uh, quantum interference, if you excuse the pun, constructively. OK, all right. Now, I'll get you to laugh at the next one. Uh, but in any case, you might wonder, well, how do we do this? Well, with ordinary computers, we've more or less kind of boiled down to a couple of, of, of very good technology. CMOS is used for almost everything. But with quantum computers, Actually, we don't have a single hardware platform that has all the features that we would like at the moment. There's a number of different uh, uh, options. They all have different pros and they have different cons. But the one that's matured the most and is maturing at the fastest rate right now is superconducting quantum bits. And that's what I'm, pro I'm going to be talking about for, for the majority of the talk. These are the kind of quantum bits that Google, IBM, as well as Intel uh, are, are exploring. And they're very fast. They don't live very long. Their lifetimes are about on the order of um, 30 to 100 microseconds. But their gate speeds are about 10 gigahertz. So you can still do a fair bit before the, the qubit information dies. Um, but the important thing is, is that we can scale them out to relatively large systems. There's no fundamental limitations that we see to making 10,000 to a million of these things, apart from running into some hard engineering problems with controlling them that I'll get to later. So, to give you an idea, or what does a quantum compu computer end up looking like? Or where, what are the sorts of pieces of it that we're going to have to think about together in order to be able to solve a hard problem? Well, the very first thing that we've got to think about is applications. What the heck are we going to solve on this? And can we think of a problem that's going to be so important and so valuable as to justify the years uh, of effort and the serious engineering problems we're going to face in order to be able to build a device that can do this. The next thing that we're going to do is once we've got a high level description of an algorithm, we're going to have to compile this into a set of gates that our computer knows how to interpret. And that's, that's what I refer to as the logical quantum gate level. So those gates that I showed you previously at the beginning, you could think of these as logical quantum gates. They're not actually the gates necessarily you'll be physically applying on your system, but they'll be the gates that you think about uh, as the next kind of level of description for everything. Beneath that, you've got the quantum error correction. All of those gates are going to be have, to have to be translated through quantum error correction into things that are actually robust and can be implemented within reasonable error on a quantum computer. Beneath that, we're going to have the raw physical operations. And beneath that, we have the, we have the materials slash device layer, which is all the hardcore engineering that ends up going into building the physical elements of the quantum computer. But you can see there's a host of different moving parts that all have to interact with each other in order to be able to make this quantum computer real. And every aspect of this stack, if we want to be able to get the most out of a quantum computer, have to be aware about all the other ones. Okay? And at the moment, that's one of the big challenges of the field. There are very few people who understand more than maybe one or the next layer down from this. And in order to, for us to be really successful, we've got to have more people that understand all, if not most, of these layers of the stack. All right? 
And so just to give you an idea about the challenges, there's a couple of challenges that I want to really uh, uh, say in uh, call out in particular. Number three is one of the most important ones. Well, we've demonstrated in experiment the basic core idea of quantum error correction, which is that we can redundantly encode quantum information across many quantum bits in order to protect it from the environment, we haven't been able to show a profitable application of this, i.e., the errors that we create by trying to encode the quantum information in these states are bigger than the errors we would have seen if we didn't bother in the first place. Okay? So that we need to hit that break-even point in order to really be able to kind of make progress in a scalable way towards this hardware. And we're almost there, but we're not quite there yet. Another thing that's worth mentioning is that we've got problems with our physical operations. So right now, we're used to incredibly reliable gates in our system. I've seen some estimates uh, for uh, some families of transistors that suggest you can get on the order of 10 to the 12 or higher gate operations before a failure. Uh, in, in, for us, we end up getting a failure between about 1 to 0.3%, depending on the, uh, the, the hardware, depending on the, the way it's calibrated. So, that means air correction is going to have to be a first class citizen in this space unless we can have some fundamental improvements down there because we're constantly going to have to be fixing errors. And if we're not breaking even, then we've got a problem. So the point of my talk now is to really kind of talk about, OK, how much air correction are we going to need? How many gates are we going, are going to have to have in a quantum computer? And what sorts of things are we going to have to do in order to be able to control the hardware? All right. So let's, talk, let's start taking these layers apart piece by piece for a practical application for this. So the application I'm going to take a look at is something that I, I've spent years looking at, which is uh, simulating chemistry on quantum computers. Chemistry is really kind of interesting. I, I think Paul Dirac first ended up saying that Chemistry is the physics that's too hard for physicists. And they, there's some truth to it, because for strongly correlated uh, systems, often those con containing heavy metals, actually there's no, nobody knows good ways of approximating what the ground state energy is for these systems. And we need that in order to be able to understand a lot of things about reaction kinetics. So in order to be able to do this on a quantum computer, what we do is we start with a physical molecule. Right? We then want to be able to map that to a simulated molecule in the quantum computer. Now, the way the simulation works is the quantum bits in the quantum computer, it turns out, are logically equivalent to the molecular orbitals that you would use to describe that. So in some profound sense, we're actually kind of tricking the quantum computer into thinking it's a molecule. And then we're asking questions of the molecule, which are, would then be equivalent to doing an experiment in the lab. That's the way that this, this form of simulation ends up working. But of course, we can't do it directly. We've got to throw in some sort of a mathematical model in here. And so like you would take, say, one of the first quantized models out of this or a second quantized model out of a, a different book and then simulate that on a quantum computer. OK, so how would you end up doing this? There's several steps in this. First thing, there's an encoding step. You take the, uh, if you input, take the input model for the quantum um, algorithm or the molecule you want to simulate, and you initialize a state that's approximately, say, the ground state of that molecule in the quantum computer. Right? Then what you do is you you've got to model the dynamics. So you turn the dynamics into a sequence of gates that the quantum computer understands how to do. So you build a, a gate sequence that's logically equivalent to the natural dynamics that you would see in the mathematical model. And there's various techniques for doing that compilation process. Then what you would do for this problem is you would want to read out the energy and use techniques like phase estimation uh, for this. And here's a, a list of a total, totally unbiased list of important papers in all of these areas that uh, have come out in the last couple of years. But <laughs> all joking aside, one of the things that's actually very important to recognize uh, from this is actually many of the techniques that have fundamentally changed this space are only a couple of years old. Like before 20, well, LCU, for example, linear combinations of unitaries was invented in 2012, but it was only made practical in uh, 2016. And within the last few years, it's really fundamentally changed the field. And also at the same time, these new ideas like cubitization have given us 
profoundly different ways of encoding uh, or, uh, these, the dynamics. Also, preparation methods, we've made some great uh, advances with that. And uh, phase estimation, only this year have we actually come out with provably optimal approaches for this. But still, there's a lot more stuff that can be done to use prior information that we haven't considered. So this is a very, very active field. And big improvements are continuing to happen. But what target do we want to hit? So I'm going to talk about probably the problem in chemistry that I'm most passionate about. And that's fertilizer. And I know many of you think that that topic might stink. <laughs> thanks, thanks, I appreciate that. But the thing about um, uh, fertilizer production that's uh, actually really kind of interesting is that the vast majority of the fertilizer uh, uh, that we make, the ammonia in it is produced via the Haber process. The Haber process, well, invented at the turn of the 20th century, is actually one of the most important processes right now, contain, uh, taking up about like one to two-ish percent of the world's uh, energy, actually, at the moment, goes into this one chemical process. And so you would imagine, given its importance, that someone would have found a nice catalyst for doing this cheaply, because it has to be done at extremely high temperature and pressure. That's why it uses up such a huge fraction of the world's energy. But it turns out, despite a century, nobody's figured out a way of doing this practically. However, bacteria actually have. And so bacteria can do this at room temperature and pressure using, well, this molecule. Technically, actually, this is the active site inside a much larger molecule. But this acts like a molecular knife that ends up splitting the triple bond that holds nitrogen together in order to be able to form ammonia. And we don't understand how this works. And unfortunately, we can't also just use this molecule because of the fact that it breaks down in an aerobic environment. So if you have oxygen, it just falls apart. And that makes it not cost effective. But if we could understand the principles behind this molecule, then perhaps we could design our own catalyst that would be resistant to oxygen. That would allow us to be able to produce cheap fertilizer. But despite that, Nobody's been able to solve this problem. The reason why is because this complex in the center is an iron molybdenum sulfur complex. It has a ton of d electrons, super huge electron correlations. The, these make all known approximation methods fail. So despite having known about this molecule for years, people have no, knowledge, uh, no deep understanding for why it works. And so the idea is, well, could we use a quantum computer to be able to attack this? And the answer is yes, actually. So what, what, what my colleagues and I ended up doing is taking a look at this application and compiling it down to a set of logical gates. And to give you an idea about the number of gates that we end up needing uh, for this compilation process, we get about 10 to the 14 gates. Now, most people, when they look at that, who are experimentalists, they'll start laughing. Because you know 100 is hard. <laughs> 10 to the 14, that's beyond hard. Now, it wouldn't it be hard for your, for your computer? It would take probably a couple of hours to chug through that many uh, gates. But for a quantum computer at the moment, that seems nigh impossible. But I should mention that these improvements over here were already requiring a large number of circuit optimizations that people didn't know previously. And these numbers were orders of magnitude lower than anything anybody had seen before. So this was the first time anybody saw numbers coming out of a quantum application of this sort that looked, well, far beyond what we have at the moment, but not inconceivable. And so this ended up giving us some more excitement, because to us, this said, all right, we're on to something. Because if we just tried a few very basic things and we started getting numbers that looked realistic, well, maybe it's time to redouble our efforts and pull these numbers even lower. All right? So, that's, that's that, but to give you an idea of uh, what happens is that if we wanted to be able to do this on existing quantum computers, again, as I said, the error rates are, let's be optimistic, 0.3%. And let's say that we could build a quantum computer that was large enough to do this. We'd only need about 130 quantum bits, which is about twice the size of, uh, of Google's uh, most recent device. However, using the error rates that we get for this, we end up finding the probability of, of having a fault is about this, which, you know, is one. <laughs> uh, so that means that the, those errors are too big. So we're going to need quantum error correction in order to be able to get this to work. If we take a look at the numbers 
of the physical qubits that we're going to need to redundantly encode the information for this, we end up finding that we're going to need numbers depending on the error rates using these techniques that range between about 10 to the 5 physical qubits to 10 to the 8, depending on where we're at. So we're currently at 70. Okay, So we're, still, we're looking at a big, big device, even to do a relatively small quantum computation on 130-ish quantum bits. Okay, So that's it. And, um, However, as I said, this wasn't, we didn't see this as the end. We actually started seeing this as the beginning because these numbers looked far too daunting. So we started asking, OK, well, are there simpler problems? Can we compile these circuits more effectively? Can we start considering new, newer techniques? And by doing that, we ended up looking at Fermi-Hubbard models as well as this uniform electron gas problem and showed that we can actually solve hard problems that nobody knows how to solve at the moment using basically 10 to the 7 gates as opposed to 10 to the 14 gates. And on top of that, then even with physically realistic error rates like 10 to the minus 3, which is arguably achievable now, we could actually do that with somewhere between a bit under a million physical qubits. Okay, so that's looking a lot better than the 10 to the 8 that the previous application suggested. So this is actually giving us hope. And we're continually finding factors of two improvement. And there's tons of techniques that haven't been brought to the table yet with this. So a lot of applications are optimizations on the application slash the fault tolerant layer of compiling it down can have profound ramifications on the number of gates that we need at the uh, level of error correction or the number of qubits that we need at the level of error correction. Okay, So that's, that's basically that. And so to give you an idea about what this would end up looking like, this, this, these superconducting devices, this is an example of uh, the original Google US, uh, uh, um, sorry, I was getting, uh, yeah, these original Google chip from uh, the Martinez group in Santa Barbara. Um, this has nine quantum bits, and you can see the quantum bits up here. And these are control wires down here. This device sits at the bottom of a dilution refrigerator, like around here, which ranges between about 15 to about 30 millikelvin. So this is a very cold environment. Now, it's important because this is a cold environment, but the fridge doesn't have much power. It's actually only got a couple of watts of cooling power. And this is an important issue because of the fact that each of these individual qubits over here has to be controlled. And on top of that, with error correction, we need to be constantly reading out results and making decisions based on that. If we have any electronics in the vicinity of this, we'll quickly overwhelm our cooling budget for this. So we have to have electronics that are further up in this stack, likely are between 70 and 4 Kelvin, somewhere around here. And also make sure the latency is low enough that we can communicate back and forth before the 30 microseconds end up elapsing and the qubits end up dying. Okay? To give you an idea about how this error correction would end up working, what we would need for these sorts of, for the last applications that I showed you, is we'd need about not terribly crazy throughputs back and forth, but about 10 gigahertz. The problem is that the, um, the wiring constraints that we end up uh, uh, dealing with this make it very difficult in order for us to be able to actually get signals back and forth without crosstalk, killing our ability to control each of those individual things. So we need to really worry about how to control that. And also, at the top layer, we get all these measurements back that tell us which quantum bits have had a fault. Then we need to do a correction and send information back down again. So we need to be constantly communicating back and forth very rapidly. And that's another area that we need to think about, because there's some very interesting computer engineering that we're going to need to do in order to be able to keep up with all of the data that's flying in from the quantum computer. So the other thing I should mention is that, at present, the way that people typically end up doing these experiments is they'll multiplex to some extent, but this er these early experiments for every qubit, we had to get a single AWG, or these days, more frequently, people will be using FPGAs for this to control every single qubit. Because each quantum bit 
is engineered specifically, like it's fabricated, it's a, it's a circuit. It's going to have its own faults and its own idiosyncrasies. And so we've got to be able to tune and calibrate each one of these things, ideally individually, but with advances in materials, the hope is that we could get all of these so that we don't need one AWG per, per this, because every AWG can cost tens of thousands of dollars, <laughs> and we'll need 500,000 plus of them. Okay, so there's going to be, have to be a lot of custom chips that people are, are going to design in order to be able to profitably control these things, and a lot of calibration issues that go into this. So let's talk about calibration. So I think from my perspective now that I'm an academic, the most important resource is grad student hours. Okay, and it takes many, many grad student hours to calibrate a uh, superconducting device. A good grad student can tune up uh, a single quantum bit in about an hour. Okay, if we've got a million of them, it's going to be very, very difficult in order to be able to do that. So how would we end up building this? And the answer is, well, we can't rely entirely on humans to be able to do everything. We're going to have to begin shifting the burden over to computers to do this. So a lot of the work that I've done in, in this space ends up looking at um, using machine learning as well as artificial intelligence in order to be able to come up with smarter ways of autonomously tuning that maybe can't quite do as well as a good graduate student can do. But at least I think I've gotten to the point where I can do better than a horrible grad student does. So give you an idea about this. Here's some recent work that we ended up doing involving using machine learning in order to be able to tune quantum dot based qubits. So the idea basically is that what we have is we have our quantum, um, quantum dots. There's two regimes that they're in. This is what people in the community call the single dot regime. What they'll do is they'll look at this, these plots, which are called a charge stability diagram. And in order to get the device to work well, it has to approach this kind of honeycomb pattern that you see down here. If it's tuned, uh, if, it, if each dot is cut off from its environment too much, it'll be in this regime, which is called the single dot regime up here. And so literally, the only way that we know how to be able to tune is to get somebody to stare at these plots and say, does this look more like a honeycomb or does this look more like lines? And so what we did in order to be able to do this is since the objective function was so ill-posed, we used neural networks as well as other um, machine learning ideas in order to be able to classify the difference between these two in order to act as a surrogate for a human so that we could get these devices in order to push it into the, the gate voltages on the system in order to push from this regime into that one. And so here's some examples of different classifiers that we use, and they work pretty well for this task. And uh, two examples of cooldowns where, at least on the second cooldown, we were actually able to successfully tune all the devices on the chip that weren't broken. So this was, this was actually really cool, because this also took place in, on the order of a few milliseconds. So it's an example of work towards what we're going to need to do in order to be able to build this quantum computer that has millions of qubits. We'll need to start incorporating ideas that look like this in order to be able to take humans out of the loop. Or we're going to need a revolution in materials so that our qubits are so perfect that we don't need this kind of insane calibration. But at the moment, we've got no choice but this. Oh, and by the way, this also has to be repeated about like once a day or so. So let's take a look at another example of this, which is readout. Now, this example that I'm giving is one that we did for characterizing some nitrogen vacancy center qubits. And, but this exact same problem that we did over here for, in this case, magnetic field sensing. This actually is a generic problem that everybody begins with all of their qubits in order to test to see if they're working. Basically, what this problem is, is this problem it involves having this uh, defect, which is a, a, a vacancy where nitrogen ordinarily would be inside a lattice of carbon and with nitrogen as well as other defects, potentially. And this vacancy ends up creating kind of like a pseudo spin that's present that can be manipulated inside the lattice. And so when we end up taking a look at this, this spin is susceptible to external magnetic fields. And actually, it's a very, very sensitive magnetic field sensor. 
And people have, have shown their great, shows great promise for being able to do uh, not just measuring the, uh, the magnitude of magnetic fields, but also the direction in samples. But in order to get it to measure reliably, we need to be able to do this at very low temperatures. So all of these great sensitivity results happened when people lowered the temperature to about 4 Kelvin. And so when, when I got involved in this project, <laughs> I, being somebody who hasn't, hadn't spent very much time in um, um, nitrogen vacancy centers, but had spent a lot of time in machine learning, I couldn't help but ask, well, have you tried using statistics? And they said, what? What, <laughs> what do you mean? And I said, well, you've always got two options when you're trying to um, process data. You could either do sophisticated analysis on crappy data, or you could build a beautiful experiment and do easy analysis on the data in the end. If you don't have the ability to do a great experiment, then, well, maybe you should just try to do more sophisticated data processing. So that was the goal of this project, to be able to detect a magnetic field on these, these qubits at room temperature without cooling it down to liquid helium temperature and just use statistical inference on top of it and see how close can we get to the four Kelvin results. And the answer is, well, we actually managed to tie, it turns out. And so the way that we did this is we used Bayesian inference on it and we found, computed a likelihood function. Oh, that got cropped a little bit, my apologies. But in any case, what ended up happening is that we ran it through our Bayesian inference protocol, and you can take a look at the data versus the fit that it ended up learning through Bayesian inference. And despite the fact that our data is horrible, we ended up actually doing exceptionally well, and the sensitivities that we ended up getting for this as a device actually were state of the art, despite the fact that we were running this at room temperature. And so, again, this model that we're taking a look at. It is the exact same model that we end up getting for tuning our single qubit gates in the superconducting qubits. So by taking these techniques forward, we can use this in order to be able to accurately learn how to control each of the individual qubits, which is going to be necessary in order for us to be able to hit all the nines needed in order to be able to make uh, air correction profitable, okay? And I should also mention something else that's really kind of cool about this. And again, I apologize for this clipping. What happened is our technique also can learn time-dependent magnetic fields. So by using the same inference technique, because it only keeps track of its prior information, it doesn't kind of come up with a global estimate. When we change the magnetic field, interestingly, the algorithm actually automatically learned that its prior assumptions were wrong and switched to the correct value of the field, as you can see in this plot, where these blue lines represent um, um, the, uh, rate of the uncertainty that we end up getting for the standard methods, and the red shaded areas are the uncertainty that we end up getting from our method. So by using Bayesian inference, we note that it can beautifully track the time, or track the values that are shifting around for the magnetic fields, but uh, also report the uncertainty and give better uncertainties than the short time Fourier transform methods that people had used previously. So this gives you some idea about how we can characterize quantum systems kind of more broadly, okay? So, all right, to, to conclude, I've discussed a bunch of different layers of the stack and what shape a quantum computer would likely have to take in order to be able to uh, solve these, these particular problems. So first thing that, we've got to, that I'd like you to be able to walk away from this talk is that building a useful quantum computer isn't going to be easy. Based on what we know right now, the best kinds of numbers that I can give you for solving a problem that would be hard at the moment with current hardware are likely on the order of about 100,000 quantum bits. And those are state of the art, mind you. So if that's the case, we are going to have to commit ourselves to building a scalable quantum computer that isn't just going to be a experiment. We're going to have to think about how to handle all of these things involving wiring, involving calibration of each of the qubits, involving optimizing the error correcting codes. Every element of this stack is going to have to be aware of all the other ones in order to overcome the challenges that we're going to face 
building a, a quantum computer. We're going to need, as I said, about a 10,000 fold increase of this. We're going to need to make quantum error correction practical. We're going to need to improve our algorithms in order to be able to match the limitations that we'll invariably find in the other levels of the stack. We're going to need automatic calibration or much more efficient graduate students, but I'm betting on calibration. The, uh, we're going to need new ways of characterizing devices. And I think when we include all of these things put together, we really are going to have a chance at delivering the world's first quantum computer to solve something useful within a relatively sensible period of time. I strongly believe that if nothing new comes up, uh, that we could be seeing technology like this in perhaps less than 20 years. And I really do believe if you take a look at the scope of the interdisciplinary effort that's going to be required in order to solve this, we really won't have seen anything comparable in the history of science with the possible exception of m the moon landing and the creation of the atomic bomb. Thank you very much. It's time for questions. So you mentioned that uh, the use of error correcting code is not profitable yet, but we're getting close. So can you elaborate on what you mean by close? Specifically, are there applications, maybe statistical in nature, uh, in which we can live with current error rates and no error correcting codes? Or is some breakthrough on the horizon to push error rates down so that then we can do reasonable codes on top of it? Fantastic question. So the question, as far as, as far as I got, is that in the near term, are there things that are perhaps more modest that we could do that um, um, would be implementable and have an impact on our algorithms? And also, is there anything potentially on the horizon that would help our error rates get to the point where error correcting codes can be profitable? So just to be clear about what I mean by profitable is that when you're encoding anything, there's always three steps, right? There's kind of like the encoding step, there's the, uh, like a memory or gate step, and there's a decoding step that you'll need to do. And so with the problem is, is that what we've done at present is that by using error correcting codes, we've actually showed that we can keep quantum information alive for much longer than it would have previously. But we need gates to be able to encode that. And those gates come with errors. And when we sum all the errors and compare the benefits that we get over the lifetime of the qubits, we end up doing slightly worse with present technology than we would have if we'd done nothing. Now, the slope for the quality of the qubits looks totally different. You take this huge hit, and then it's very, very slow decay, versus the other one, no hit, and much faster decay. So it indicates that the principles of quantum error correction are valid, but we've got some problems. Now, the question is, is there something more modest? Well, one thing that we can do is rather than looking at error correction, we can actually set our sights on error detection. So if our error rates are sufficiently small and we've got an error detecting code, then what we can do is we can say, hey, let's just find if there was an error. And if there was an error, well, we'll throw out that data and we'll try again. And that can, that can be very useful for reducing the errors in a post-selected way at the expense of taking longer. And techniques like this, known as error mitigation, are uh, kind of like the new fad when it comes to this. Um, but when it comes to making error correction more profitable, there's a number, a number of different technologies looking at this. I think the most ambitious one is Microsoft's uh, attempt to, be a, to build a topological quantum computers, which could have error rates which are 10,000 to a million times better than what superconducting qubits can currently do, which could lead to a thousand-fold reduction in the number of quantum bits needed previously. We would still need a thousand or so, um, topological quantum bits in order to be able to do this, because a little bit of error correction, it turns out, will still be needed. But a problem with the um, Microsoft approach is that they haven't demonstrated one qubit yet. <laughs> so at present, it's a, it's a very, there's a lot of hope behind it, but it turns out also that it requires showing a new, new set of particles that nobody's ever seen before in the wild. And a Nobel Prize could even be won before anybody builds a quantum computer from it. So there's some hope, but who knows when it'll happen. 
so, so the there's this concept called noise and intermediate scale quantum computing, which is uh, supposed the technology you're currently at. So which one of these uh, uh, your application you propose will be able to run such an intermediate scale system you know, with a hundred qubits, uh, quantum chemistry, or anything else can be? So, okay, let me be honest about noisy intermediate scale quantum computing. I wish I could say that there's, I, I have hope for it, but I don't <laughs> at all. Um, every calculation that I and everybody else I know has done has suggested that our error rates are too high and quantum error correction isn't profitable. So there, we don't see any ways that we can be able to beat for any application that people have dreamt up at the moment, existing computers for that. If I, if I had about a factor of 1,000 improvement then in the gates, the gate accuracies, then maybe. But at the moment, nobody really knows for sure if there's any benefits there. And I think that one of the big issues, or one of the big, I think, hopeful things about this era is figuring out better ways, like I was talking about previously, of coping or living with errors. Because even if we can't get the noisy intermediate scale quantum devices to be useful, many of these techniques for dealing with errors might also be useful once we get error correction profitable. Because it'll just allow us to tolerate more error than we would have been previously. So you mentioned uh, your work on phase estimation. Uh, what am I missing? You, just before that, you said you were trying to measure energy. Yeah. And all the probabilities that you showed, <coughs> they're on the magnitude square of the wave function. So yes. where is the phase? Where's the energy? energy? Yeah. Where's the so basically, what's the phase estimation? Okay. What's the phase estimation? How does that, that work? All right. So what, how phase estimation works is if you take a look at energy, we, don't, we obviously can't directly measure energy back out. But if you look at the solution of the Schrodinger equation, the time evolution operator is like e to the minus i uh, Hamiltonian or energy operator times time. Okay? So what that means is phase estimation, it doesn't give us energy. What it does is it gives us those, uh, it gives us basically e to the minus i energy times time. Now, if you know the time that you evolve for and you're not wrapping around the unit circle, then in that case, you can just divide through the phase that you end up getting from that to get it out. And in case you're wondering how this, this estimation of the phase works, is basically we build a quantum circuit that implements a Mach Zender interferometer. And we, use, we basically use interferometry in a fancy way in order to be able to learn the phase difference between one path where this quantum transformation is applied and another one where it isn't. And that, that gives us the phase difference. And then when we divide through by the time we picked, that gives us the energy. Okay. Is there any other question? Oh, oh. Just one more. In the slide of this nitrogen fixation catalyst, you show that the, the simulate, quantum simulation can give you energy levels, but I don't see how that tell you this molecule will do nitrogen fixation. Mm -hmm. You know, where that chemical reaction goes into your, you know, quantum chemistry yeah. simulation. Okay. So what I didn't mention is that this is actually part of a larger hybrid quantum classical algorithm. So in order to be able to figure out whether or not uh, energy dynamics are favorable, what we need to do is we need to be able to figure out what the free energy difference between two different configurations is. And so what we're doing is the enthalpy is the part that's very difficult to be able to compute using a classical computer. Entropy is cheap. So what we do is we'll do a molecular dynamics simulation, which will usually give us enough accuracy to get the entropy difference of two configurations. And then we can see whether or not a segment of a path in a reaction pathway that a chemist proposes is thermodynamically favorable from that, the entropy difference and the enthalpy difference. Okay, uh, I think we have a lot of questions. So yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Great, thank you very much.